At the start of every marketing conference, the organizer usually gets up and says something like, this is the only marketing conference that, and then they go on to complete that sentence and they say something unique and interesting about their event. I'd like to take a stab at completing that sentence today. DOLA is the only marketing conference that starts off with a group breathing exercise. Now follow along with me. Everybody come sit down. Patrick, Ari, come. We're going to do this together. Nina, Danny. And if you're a veteran meditator, this will be very easy. But if you're new to breathing exercises, as I am, um, you might feel a little bit uncomfortable. But it's okay. You're all going to have your eyes closed. I'm the only one that's going to see what a nerd you look like. And, and it's not just for relaxation. We're going to get back to this in a moment and see what we've gained from it. So everybody, close your eyes. Take a deep breath in, four seconds. One, two, three, four. Hold the breath. Exhale through your mouth. It helps if your feet are on the ground, if your hands are on your knees. And continue taking these long, deep breaths. Visualize the air coming in through your body, circulating through your, your brain, your head, exhaling through your arms. Imagine the air traveling down your legs, through your feet, through your toes. Breathe in, breathe out. Now, while you're doing this, try to imagine yourself in a year from now. And be very optimistic. And, and think maybe there's a new skill you want to learn this year. Maybe there's a job you want to land, a client you want to land, maybe a character trait you want to work on. And just imagine what that person says, thinks, how do they behave differently than you behave now? Keep breathing, four seconds in. Contrast that person that you might be in a year from now with that person today. Maybe you want to be able to wake up on time, show up to work on time, you know who you are. Um, okay, let's open our eyes. Hold that experience for a moment. We're going to get back to it in a couple minutes. We're programmed to believe that success, accomplishment, is a precursor to happiness. If we could just land that next job, if we could just lose some weight, if we can get our wife to lower the damn heat, then we'll be happy. But we're actually pretty bad at, do at doing just that. Hundreds of books and hundreds of psychologists have explained why. They've explained the psychological tricks our minds play on us. They explain why our brains are perfectly capable of imagining the future. But we're basically incapable at accurately predicting what will make us happy when we get there. And psychologists discovered that our brains are strangely fixated on the present. That when we try shining that, that mental floodlight on our future selves, we still wind up stumbling around in the dark, only able to see a few feet in front of us. But until the last decade or so, these psychologists basically left it at that. We have a very good understanding of a lot of these seemingly silly tricks that our minds play on us, but we've, we've been helpless against them. But today, I'd like to address some newer research, research that looks at this sort of constricted halo of light in a whole new light. But before we get there, let's take a step back and get on the same page with the word happiness. We use the word all the time. But if I ask you to define, define happy, we say we're happy, so define the word happiness. You'd probably be reminded of some idiot kid asking you to define the word the and making a very compelling case for corporal punishment in the process. We say things like, I'm so happy. That would make me happy. I want to be happy. I used to be happy. Or I've never been happy. Or if your wife comes home and excitedly tells you that she's going to go to Miami for three nights with her sisters, and you're going to stay home to mind the juvenile delinquents, you might say, I'm not happy, but of course, I'm happy that you're happy. Now, while the word happy might mean three completely separate things each time you use it in the sentence, what we typically are trying to describe when we say happy is 
that you know what I mean feeling. It's a positive experience. And we're describing a totally subjective state of mind. And here's the key. Because the feeling of happiness is an abstraction, it has no objective referent in the physical world. This is a yellow slide. We may think of yellow as a color, but yellow is not actually a color. Yellow is a, is a psychological state. Yellow is the experience that we feel or that we perceive when light hits our eyes at a wavelength of 580 nanometers. And if you had to explain the experience of yellow to someone who has never seen yellow before, all you'd be able to do is to point to things that are like yellow. You'd point to a rubber duck, you'd point to a lemon, you'd point to a school bus, you'd point to this slide and you'd say, you know what is common in the visual experience of all these things? It's called yellow. And because happiness, like yellow, are both subjective states, nothing you can point to and nothing that you can compare them with will ever replace having those experiences themselves. And that's what psychologists refer to as something being, being irreducible. And this idea has been eloquently stated um, and put into much nicer words by philosophers and poets. Here's a couple good ones. Because emotional happiness is an experience, it can only be approximately defined by its antecedents, what caused it and by its relation to other experiences. And Alexander Pope, who was a poet, and he concluded his essay on man with who thus define it, say more or less than this, that happiness is happiness. But putting aside all the linguistic challenges around talking about happiness, we all strive for happiness. We all want it. Freud was a very big champion of this idea. Um, he believed that the fundamental drive of our lives was to become happy and to remain happy, to avoid pleasure and to experience, to avoid pain and to experience pleasure. But way before Freud, back in the 1600s, French mathematician Blaise Pascal was very clear about this. He says, all men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it is the same desire in both, attended with different views. The will never takes the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action of every man, even those who hang themselves. But as psychologists discovered, although we universally and unequivocally strive for happiness by imagining our future selves and charting a course toward a future of pleasure and contentment, we spin our rudders and ultimately find out that the future is never as good or as air conditioned as we imagine it to be. And there are many interesting mistakes our brains make when we imagine our futures. And if you're not happy just being unhappy and you'd be happy to learn about them, you can read all the books. But let's just take a look at one of these tricks our minds play on us called the habituation effect. Now imagine you and your friend finally got a reservation at this chic new restaurant in town after a three month waiting list. You both browse the menu and you both decide that your number one favorite dish would be the cowboy steak with smoked shallots and a red wine demi-glaze. But of course it would be so de classe, so gauche, so uncool to order the exact same dish that one of you decide to order the cowboy steak and your friend will order the La Burger Extravagant and you'll share both dishes. Now, if we were to measure your satisfaction after this meal, we'd find that you actually, you and your friend were both happier with the sharing arrangement than had you each ordered your number one favorite dish. Now imagine after the meal, the maitre d' of the restaurant comes over to you and says, you know what, I'm going to invite you back for a free meal once a month for an entire year. But because the, the restaurant sometimes runs out of ingredients, you need to select every dish that you're going to have for every month right now. So of course, you browse the menu again. You know that the cowboy steak is your number one favorite dish. But of course, it would be say, so de classe, so uncool to order the exact same dish 12 times in a row. You tell the maitre d' to, to give you the cowboy steak every other month. And in the remaining months, fill it in with your number two, your number three, your number four favorite dish. But you'd be wrong. When we decide how we will feel about things that will happen in our future, we tend to imagine how we would feel if those things happened right now. We imagine time as a spatial dimension. We say the past is behind us. The future is in front of us. We're moving toward our old age. We're looking back on our childhood. But that's a spatial dimension. That's a sequential dimension. Time is not like that. Time is an abstraction. And we have a very hard time conceptualizing abstractions. If I tell you that you ate brunch before you fed your rabbit, but after you read the funny pages, you would put those things in a line. 
I would put the funny pages on the left, then I would put eating brunch in the middle, and I would put feeding my rabbit on the right. It would be a line. We would imagine it spatially. But that's not exactly how time works. And there was some very serious research containing thousands of bags of potato chips conducted by Nobel Prize winning economists to illustrate this very point. In 1999, Barbara Kahn and Daniel Kahneman invited a whole bunch of volunteers to a lab in, over the course of successive weeks. And they asked this group of people to choose the snacks they would get every time they visited the lab. And just like you did, talking to the maitre d', the volunteers chose a healthy variety of their top three, four favorite snacks. But then they invited two more groups, and they didn't give them a choice. The first group, they fed a variety of the favorite snacks to, and the second group, they always got their favorite snack. It was one snack, it was their favorite snack, and that's the snack they got every single time they came to, partic to participate in the experiment. And when the researchers measured the satisfaction of the volunteers at the end of the study, they found that the volunteers in the no variety group were much happier, the ones getting the same exact snack every single week. They were happier than those in the variety group. In other words, variety made people less happy in this case, not more happy. So why does variety make you happier when you sit down to dinner with your friend over the course of one meal, but less happy when you consume snacks over the course of successive weeks? The answer lies in the habituation effect combined with our inability to conceptualize the abstraction of time. Um, awesome things, wonderful things, they get less awesome, they get less wonderful with repetition. The, the first time my, my first son, my first child, uh, looked up at me and said, you're Papa. It was the most amazing feeling. The, my, my, my breath caught in my lungs. The, the world stopped spinning. By the time my third child looked up at me and said, you're Papa, I looked at him very perplexed and I said, and you are? Um, and then I was, the truth is, I was going over this joke with, with, I was going over the slides with my wife, I got to this joke, and she said, you idiot, your third son is th six months old, he hasn't said anything yet. But um, anyway, so this is habituation. Amazing things become less amazing over time. Psychologists call this habituation, economists call it de declining marginal utility, the rest of us call it marriage, but either way, this is what happens. Habituation, though, can be beat by increasing variety or increasing the amount of time that separates these experiences. And we could illustrate this point with, a, with Harvard psychologist Daniel Gilbert's hedonometer machine, a device that measures pleasure in units of hedons. So now let's make a couple assumptions real quick. Let's assume the first bite of your cowboy steak brings you 50 units of pleasure, and the first bite of La Burger brings you 45 units of pleasure. Now let's assume that with every successive bite of a dish, you get a few less hedons of pleasure. That's our habituation rate assumption. Now let's make a consumption rate assumption. Imagine you eat, on the bottom here, one bite every 30 seconds. According to this chart, the way to maximize your pleasure is to take three bites of the cowboy steak, and then on the fourth bite, switch to the La Burger. Because at that point, you'll be down to 40 hedons of pleasure for the cowboy steak, but you'll have 45 hedons of pleasure if you eat the La Burger. That would be maximizing pleasure with a 30 second interval consumption rate. However, and simply put, with a sh with when consumption is rapid, when you're taking a bite of that steak every 30 seconds, variety increases your happiness, it increases your pleasure. But if we extend our consumption rate in time, if instead of taking a bite every 30 seconds, we're taking a bite every half a day, then the, the subsequent bites of your cowboy steak are always as good as the first. The habituation effect does not occur. You're always getting 50 hedons of pleasure, and you'd be happier with less variety. But because when we imagine time, our mental images are atemporal, meaning when we imagine our future selves doing things in the future, we rarely imagine the time at which those events are taking place. If we think back to the breathing exercise we did, we imagine ourselves in the future. It's unlikely that any of us were imagi imagining what time those events were taking place in. And 
When the maitre d' asks us to choose our dishes for an entire year, plan it out now, we think of a dozen successive dishes over the course of a dozen successive weeks as if there are a dozen dishes on a table in front of us right now. We mistakenly treat sequential alternatives as though they were simultaneous alternatives. The present, and going back to that ring, that halo of light, it's so real, it's so palpable, our imagination fails to understand that our future selves will see the world very different than we do now. William Roberts, a psychologist at the University of Western Ontario wrote, the human brain is an anticipation machine and making future is the most important thing it does, but not so fast and we're, not, and we're no longer so sure about that. Because if making future, and this is like a question that I had, a question I was thinking about when I was reading this, this, these ideas. If making future was the most important thing our brains do, how could we be still so bad at it? Should we just accept that our inability to overcome what seems to be a silly mistake, like not realizing that habituation won't occur over extended periods of time, is like just an evolutionary glitch? To me, it doesn't make any sense. Our brains have evolved over millions of years. They're unbelievably advanced. It's the most powerful, complex organ of all time in any species. We could recognize complex images and ideas in 13 milliseconds, the time it takes to blink. Like, are we to, are we to accept that like, our brains keep getting tricked by thinking that we're gonna like, not have as much enjoyment from the steak or have as much enjoyment from the steak? We can't get this right? So Dr. Tal Ben-Shahar from Harvard had this exact same question. And by studying outliers in Harvard University over the course of about a decade, he went on to create Harvard's number one most popular course of all time. Maybe, Dr. Jahar proposed, our brain's overpowering fixation on the present, it's not an evolutionary flaw. It's not a mistake. It's not a glitch, something we just couldn't quite figure out but a careful, sophisticated evolutionary advantage, one much more powerful than making some accurate bets about future happiness. That our brains, when focused on today instead of tomorrow, they can literally physically stretch and grow, creating the necessary groundwork for us to be smarter, more successful, more content people, leading more meaningful lives. That ring of light, it may not seem so luminous, but that's, we've caught, that's because we've been evaluating its luminosity by its ability to see and predict the future. But if we were to evaluate it from a different angle, if we were to zoom in, we find something much more interesting. That our brains have evolved to be capable of change in the present and that an optimistic, appreciative, and happy brain is a brain more capable of succeeding, more receptive to knowledge, and more adaptable to life's unpredictability. And this isn't some kumbaya, peace and love, happy crappy. This is real and this is your hippocampus, the area of the brain that's responsible for spatial memory. And in 2000, researchers in the Department of Cognitive Neurology at the University College London set out to study the hippocampi of London cab drivers. And what they found, they discovered something previously unimaginable. That the hippocampi in London cab drivers were significantly larger than the hippocampi of average citizens. And if you can't tell from the screen, on the right-hand side is the average size of the hippocampus in a London cab driver. On the left is the average size of our, I mean, unless there's, a, unless there's a London cab driver here, this is the average size of our hippocampus. And that's unbelievably bigger. It's like double the size. So what's going on here? Furthermore, these researchers found that the longer London cab drivers drove their taxis, the larger, this is not like philosophically larger, this is physical, MRI, brain scans, phys like physically larger. The larger the hippocampus grew. So why was this happening? So here's a roadmap of London and London's cab routes. It's the most complex, disharmonious, ungrid-like structure of roads and routes on the planet. And London cab drivers have to pass what's called the knowledge test, which there's a lot of literature written about this, and many people say that it's like the most stressful test in any industry anywhere in the world. They have to remember uh, 20,000 landmarks by heart, 25,000 streets, and over 350 predefined routes. It's, it's like, it's no joke. And what the researchers in London discovered was that the need to develop this vast, complex internal map 
caused the hippocampus in London cab drivers to actually increase in physical size. And this forced scientists to finally confront what they were calling the neuroplasticity myth. They had to admit that neuroplasticity was a real thing, something they hadn't previously believed, that actual structural physiological change is possible depending on how you live your life. And now finally returning to this halo of light that is so bad at seeing the future, but so unbelievably powerful at altering our present with practice, focus, mindfulness, our brains can literally change. And Dr. Shahar doesn't say this, but perhaps that's why we've, maybe we're not so great at seeing and predicting the future because it's, it's a defense mechanism, it's a protective mechanism. The brain is calling out to us, saying like, that's not the purpose of the power I have. You could, I could grow, I could change by not focusing and trying to predict the future, by orienting yourself with happiness, with appreciation, with optimism, the brain can physically enlarge. So we're not prisoners of our IQs. We're not shackled by our poor memories or fettered by our depressive states of mind. We now know that the way we think can change and alter the physiology of our brain. That happiness is not a result of success. It's a necessary precursor to everything we want and hope to achieve. So that breathing exercise we did together a few minutes ago, it was not just meant as a way to relax or to make anybody feel uncomfortable or awkward. It was perhaps the best possible exercise we could have performed to maximize our ability to retain, to understand all the very good, worthy information you're gonna receive here today at DOLA. And look, the growth in your hippocampus by doing that exercise. It might not show up on an MRI, but that's, be that's not because the growth didn't happen. That's just because the MRI technology is not yet advanced enough. And for the two of you in the audience who paid full price to get in here today, I will put a money back guarantee behind that. Thank you very much for coming, and I really hope you enjoy all the information and, and the rest of the afternoon.